You are listening to History Man, where we walk in the footsteps of heroes and proclaim freedom reigns. On today's episode, we'll be talking about the Camden Resolves and how they were instructive in the way that the initial leaders of the revolution garnered support in the backcountry of South Carolina. The Camden Resolves were published in the South Carolina Gazette dated December 12, 1774, along with the listing of Patriot signers. The Gazette would also print similar resolves from Sherall, 96, Georgetown, and other districts for the public to see. These documents were statements of conviction regarding the will of the people and their intentions toward England, should she neglect their rights as free men. Many of the signers are chronicled in the annals of our history as putting deed to their word by literally fighting for those very same freedoms over the following years. Just seven years before, in 1767, the British government of South Carolina failed to control the outlaw bands that swarmed the backcountry settlements. The robbing and pillaging of the communities around the trading hubs of Camden, Sherall, and 96 went unchecked by legislators in Charleston. The backcountry had little influence in matters of governance, as these elected lawmakers were primarily from that port city area. The inland regions were forced to extremes in regards to safety, and the courts of justice were nowhere to be found in the vicinity of the settlements. When the leaders of the communities took matters into their own hands, the empire's ruling government treated them as an unruly mob and ordered them to disperse. This escalated the habits and actions of the leaders. Regional captains of the regulator movement were formed to deal with the criminals in their midst. The events and reprisals associated with this movement became the genesis of the Circuit Court Act of 1769. The Circuit Court districts of Camden, Sherall, and 96 were established. Courts and legal processes were more accessible to the citizens. Law and order would be restored in a more substantial way in those communities. In the fall of 1774, tensions were approaching a climax in South Carolina and the rest of the colonies between the British and the freedom-loving citizens of the state. The Intolerable Acts, passed and forced upon the colonies, fueled the dissension. The royal legislature, caught between the wishes of the crown and the needs of the South Carolinians, was impotent in working out remedies. Disaffected citizens and some hand-picked legislators formed their own independent government, and set about doing the necessary work that had ground to a halt. This marked a time when two different legislatures acted on behalf of the citizens of the state, one tied to the British King George and the other tied to the patriot leaders who were intent on independence. The grand jury during these times was a catalyst for change and a mouthpiece for the wishes of the citizenry in their dealings with the government. The grand jury's purview extended beyond the criminal statutes that encumber the calendar of today's court dockets. These proceedings would involve matters that seem petty by today's standards, but in the time around the revolution, all manner of grievances were addressed by the jurist in these proceedings. Their wishes were relayed to the highest offices in the colony for action. On October 20th, 1774, representatives of South Carolina met with other colonial leaders in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and formed a Continental Association of Colonies against Britain. It was decided that boycotts of British goods were to start taking place at the 1st of December. However, in Charleston, the shipping of tea was already being interdicted. Newspaper articles of those Patriot Acts were reported in the Gazette and were evidence of a coming confrontation with King George. The Charleston area Patriot leaders knew that they, by themselves, would not be able to fend off the British war machine. They sought to enlist the help and will of the back country. The firebrand judge, William Henry Drayton, stepped into the role as circuit court judge. He was appointed to temporarily fill a vacancy till another judge could be sent from England. His appointment raised the ire of the royal leaders, for Drayton had published a scathing pamphlet titled Freeman earlier that year. Before he was replaced or they rescinded his appointment, he seized the opportunity to use his talents for the cause against the despotic government. He sallied out into the newly formed districts of the backcountry in November of that year. 
and he addressed a selected group of grand jurists in Camden, South Carolina on the 5th of the month and delivered a charge to the jury on the rights of man under the law that would be repeated in fashion throughout the backcountry. Drayton would suffer in his standing with the crown and the royal government in South Carolina, but he rose like a zenith in the eyes of his compatriots. Drayton would address the jury with exceptionally strong rhetoric, and he would say, Gentlemen of the grand jury, you are now met to discharge one of the most important duties in society, for you are assembled arbiters of the innocence or guilt of such of your fellow citizens who were so unfortunate as to have afforded occasion, however slight, for the laws to take cognizance of their conduct. You are authorized to pass judgment, in the first instance, upon the apparently guilty wretch, and by your acquitting voice to shield apparent innocence from a malicious prosecution. Such powers have the constitution of your country vested in you, powers no less important than truly honorable when exercised with a fearless integrity. It is your indispensable duty to endeavor to exercise these powers with propriety. It is mine concisely to point out to you the line of your conduct, a conduct which the venerable constitution of your country intends by protecting the innocent and by delivering the guilty over to the course of law should operate to nourish in its native vigor even that constitution itself from whose generous spirit we have a title to call ourselves freemen, an appellation which peculiarly distinguishes the English subjects, those unfortunately disappointed fellow citizens in Quebec accepted, and ranks them above all the civilized nations of the earth. By as much as you prefer freedom to slavery, by so much ought you to prefer a generous death to servitude, and to hazard everything to endeavor to maintain that rank which is so gloriously preeminent above all other nations. You ought to endeavor to preserve it, not only for its inestimable value, but from a reverence to our ancestors from whom we received it and from a love of our children, to whom we are bound by every consideration to deliver down this legacy, the most valuable that ever was or can be delivered to posterity. It is compounded by the most generous civil liberty that ever existed, and the sacred Christian religion released from the absurdities which were inculcated, the shackles which were imposed, the tortures which were inflicted, and the flames which were lighted, blown up and fed with blood by the Roman Catholic doctrines, doctrines which tend to establish a most cruel tyranny in church and state, a tyranny under which all Europe groaned for many ages. And such are the distinguishing characters of this legacy, which may God of his infinite goodness and mercy long preserve to us and graciously continue to our posterity. But without our pious and unwearied endeavors to preserve these blessings, it is a folly and presumption to hope for a continuance of them. Hence, in order to stimulate your exertions in favor of your civil liberties, which protect our religious rights, instead of discoursing to you of the laws of other states and comparing them to our own, allow me to tell you what your civil liberties are and to charge you, which I do in the most solemn manner, to hold them dearer than your lives, a lesson and charge at all times proper from a judge, but particularly so at this crisis, when America is in one general and generous commotion touching this truly important point. It is unnecessary for me to draw any other character of those liberties that that great line by which they are distinguished and happy is it for the subject that those liberties can be marked in so easy and in so distinguishing a manner. And this is the distinguishing character. English people cannot be taxed. Nay, they cannot be bound by any law unless by their consent expressed by themselves or their representatives by their own election. This colony was settled by English subjects, by a people from England herself, a people who brought over with them, who planted in this colony, and who transmitted to posterity the invaluable rights of Englishmen, rights which no time, no contract, no climate can diminish, 
thus possessed of such rights, it is of the most serious importance that you strictly execute those regulations which have arisen from such a parentage and to which you have given the authority of laws by having given your constitutional consent that they should operate as laws. For by your not executing what those laws require, you would weaken the force and would show, I would almost say, a treasonable contempt of those constitutional rights out of which your laws arise and which you ought to defend and support at the hazard of your lives. Hence, by all the ties which mankind hold most dear and sacred, your reverence to your ancestors, your love to your own interest, your tenderness to your posterity, by the lawful obligations of your oath, I charge you to do your duty to maintain the laws, the rights, the constitution of your country, even at the hazard of your lives and fortunes. Some courtly judges style themselves the king's servants, a style which sounds harshly in my ears, inasmuch as the being a servant Im implies obedience to the orders of the master. And such judges might possibly think that, in the present situation of American affairs, this charge is inconsistent with my duty to the king. But for my part, in my judicial character, I know no master but the law. I am a servant not to the king, but to the Constitution, and, in my estimation, I shall best discharge my duty as a good subject to the king and a trusty officer under the Constitution, when I boldly declare the law to the people and instruct them in their civil rights. Indeed, you gentlemen of the grand jury cannot properly comprehend your duty and your great obligation to perform it unless you know those civil rights from which these duties spring and by knowing the value of those rights, thence you learn your obligations to perform these duties. Having thus generally touched upon the nature and importance of your civil rights in order to excite you to execute those laws to which they have given birth, I will now point out to you the particular duties which the laws of your country require at your hands. Unbiased by affection to and unawed by fear of any man or any set of men, you are to make presentment of every person and of every proceeding militating against public good. The law orders me particularly to give in charge to watch carefully over our Negro Act and our jury law, a law which cannot be too highly valued, whether we regard the excellency of its nature or the importance of its object, this law carries in itself an indelible mark of what high importance the legislator thought it when they enacted it. And it carries in itself also a kind of prophecy that its existence and its native vigor would, in after times, be endangered. And therefore, it is that the law orders the judges ever to charge the grand juries to watch over it with care. Indeed, you ought to do so with the most jealous circumspection. A learned judge says every new tribunal erected for the decision of facts without the intervention of a jury is a step towards aristocracy, the most oppressive of absolute governments. And it is therefore a duty which every man owes to his country, his friends, his posterity, and himself to maintain to the utmost of his power this valuable constitution in all its rights, to restore it to its ancient dignity, if at all impaired, to amend it wherever it is defective, and above all to guard with the most jealous circumspection against the introduction of new and arbitrary methods of trial, which, under a variety of plausible pretenses, may in time imperceptibly undermine this best preservative of English liberty. Mr. Justice Blackstone terms the English trial by jury the glory of the English law. Let me tell you, our trial by jury is that kind of glory in full meridian luster, in comparison of which the English mode appears only with diminished splendor. But let not your care of this great object occupy all your attention. You are to find all such bills of indictment as the examination of witnesses in support of them may induce you to think there is a probability that the tact 
charge is true, for you are not to exact such circumstantial and positive evidence as would be necessary to support the indictment before a petty jury. To make those presentments and to find these bills, it is not necessary that you all agree in opinion. Twelve united voices among you are sufficient to discharge the duties of a grand jury, but it is absolutely necessary that twelve of you agree in opinion upon every point under your consideration and happy, happy, thrice happy, are that people who cannot be made to suffer under any construction of the law, but by the united voices of twenty-four impartial men having no interest in the cause, but that the laws be executed and justice be administered. In short, that you may discharge your duty with propriety and that you may pursue that course of conduct which the law requires. Let me, in the strongest terms, recommend to you that you keep constantly in your mind the nature and particulars of the oath which you have just taken. To you, this oath is of as much importance as the mariner's compass is to those who sail on the ocean. This points out the course of their voyage. Your oath as clearly points out to you the course of your conduct. I dare say you are willing to discharge that duty which you owe to society. I make no doubt but that you will discharge it with advantage to the public and therefore with honor to yourselves. And after charging the juries in Camden, the jurors deliberated and came back with these presentments. We present as a grievance the extensive bounds of the parish of St. Mark, which makes it difficult for the church wardens and overseers of the poor to collect the poor tax and a great means to hinder the propagation of the gospel in the back parts of the said parish. We present as a grievance that there is not a law to ascertain the prices of entertainment at public houses, there being a great number of them in Camden District who frequently impose on strangers and travelers by making them pay ex exorbitantly for what they stand in need of to the great detriment of the poor. We present as a grievance of the most dangerous and alarming nature the power exercised by the Parliament to tax and to make laws to bind the American colonies in all cases whatsoever. We conceive such a power is destructive of our birthrights as freemen, descended from English ancestors. Seeing such freemen cannot be constitutionally taxed or bound by any law without their consent, expressed by themselves or implied by their representatives of their own election, a consent which the good people of this colony never have signified to be taxed or bound by the laws of the British Parliament, in which they never have had any constitutional representation. And whereas we rather choose to die freemen than to live slaves bound by laws, in the formation of which we have no participation, so now that the body of this district are legally assembled as one step towards the defense of our constitutional rights, which are dearer to us than our lives and fortunes, we think it our indispensable duty to the people of the district, to ourselves, the grand jurors for the body of the people, to our posterity, thus clearly to express the sense of this large and populous district, touching our constitutional rights, and the very imminent danger to which they are exposed from the usurped power of the British Parliament, taxing and by law binding the Americans in all cases whatsoever, being resolved to maintain our constitutional rights at the hazard of our lives and fortunes, we do most earnestly recommend that this presentment in particular be laid before our constitutional representatives in General Assembly, who we doubt not will do all in their power to support us in our just rights. And lastly, in testimony of the satisfaction we feel and the high estimation in which we hold the charge given by his honor, the judge at the opening of the court and the principles of loyalty and liberty in which the same is manifestly founded, and also that a lasting evidence may remain of that true and constitutional language which it is the duty of every judge to adopt in the exercise of an office instituted solely for the preservation of the laws, we make it our request that his honor will be pleased to direct the said charge to be printed and made public, fully persuaded that every man will read it 
with applause who wishes a lasting security to the British constitutional establishment of civil and religious liberty. We also recommend the publication of these presentments. Drayton's charges and the various resolves are all memorialized in articles on file from the South Carolina Gazette at the South Carolina Archives and History. The Parliamentary Register, or History of the Proceedings and Debates of the House of Commons, Volume 1, 1775, have a published account of his charge as well. The signers of these resolves are no strangers to our state's history and represented some of the leading figures in the areas beyond Charleston. The very fact that they were selected as grand jurymen meant that they were owners of the largest taxable property in the community. They were men of commerce, ability, and conscience, often laying aside personal industries for the community. Their service on the grand juries at different times throughout the year was a valuable link to the common good. Their sentiments of their rights as free men at a time of a great upheaval are instructive. The work of Judge Drayton and the grand jury of Camden so long ago have echoed into our present.